friends, my name is Emily and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to share with you my best reads of the year. So in my last video, I went through my story graph stats. I will link that above. In that video, I was really, I don't know, excited about all of the things that I really enjoyed this year. And there were a couple of things that in hindsight, I realized that in the moment I really liked. There were other things that I was surprised weren't in the five star review category just because of how much they've stood out over the year and so I'm bumping them up and mentioning them here now. Okay so one of the first things that I want to talk about is a piece of young adult fiction and that is A Winter's Promise by Christelle Dabos. This is a piece of translated young adult fantasy literature. I believe the original is in French uh, and I do believe that all four are out right now and translated into English. This is really fun. So this has Miyazaki vibes. If you're into the Studio Ghibli films, something about this sort of tickles that fancy. So this is about a girl named Ophelia who has been married off to a rival family. She has this very surly partner in Thorn and each group of people has different types of magic. She's moved to a place that is very into like illusions and secrets and, and the magic there is meant for hiding, whereas her magic is meant for reading objects and discovering truths. I don't want to say too much because I feel like part of the delight is just experiencing the vibes. It's wintry, She's moved from a warm place to a much colder place. There are small stakes things happening, but then we start to learn about an overarching mystery, an overarching issue, plot, whatever you want to call it, that Ophelia will begin to investigate over, I assume, all four books, because at the end of book two, we're sort of learning more about this world and the families and the division of magic. I don't know, I just enjoyed that it felt cozy and maybe that's because it evokes like Howl's Moving Castle for me. It feels like a cozy piece of children's literature. It also feels seasonally appropriate for right now, so if you have this on your shelves already, you are interested in it, this time of year feels appropriate as like the weather's getting colder and darker depending on where you are in the world uh, but as a Canadian reader this feels like a, an appropriate winter read. The next book that makes a favorites of the year is Lanny by Max Porter. So this is a green man retelling and we did end up reading a Green Man retelling with Silver in the Wood by Emily Tesh. I did a live stream on that that is available to the public. I'll link that above as well. So Lanny is this strange little boy and he goes missing in the woods. And throughout the book, we get different thoughts that dead Papa Toothwort is intercepting from various villager people. It's very interesting in its writing. It's very interesting in its form. It almost feels like poetry in some places. Can I get it to focus? Let's hope it focused. Like the way that the words have been put on the page is sort of playful and whimsical. If I were to tell you that this is like a green man horror novel, for whatever reason, it makes me think about some of Stephen King's stories that involve children, like The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, but the writing is a lot more challenging. Stephen King is easy reading. This has, I think, similar themes, similar vibes, but is a more challenging read. So I think if you're maybe a Stephen King fan, if you're getting into reading, Stephen King got you into reading, and you're looking for a bit of a challenge, uh, this is a dark read that is interesting. It, it's a little bit challenging in terms of form. It's weird, it's dark, it is small town drama, there's a missing little kid, there's a supernatural thing in the woods called Dead Papa Toothwort, and he is listening. <laughs> the way I describe this, like my last little like overall blurbing of this book in my reading journal is to describe it as delicious and grungy and earthy and rotten in all of the right ways. I agree with past Emily, it is a delicious read. 
and I can highly recommend it if any of that sounds interesting to you. Also, if you liked Silver in the Woods, and we read that earlier, and the parts about Silver in the Woods that you liked is the Green Man myth and somebody playing with the Green Man mythology. Lanny is playing with Green Man mythology. So this year I read The Immortal Life of Henry de Lax by Rebecca Skloot. So this is looking at Henry de Lax. It's humanizing the person whose cancer cells have been used. So she is a black woman and her cells are the HeLa cells. You hear about HeLa cells in medical texts, as if, if you're studying this, uh, but the humanity behind this black woman, Henrietta Lacks, is lost. She was a black woman with cervical cancer in the 1950s. As per all patients receiving treatments, a sample of her cervical cancer was taken. Unlike other cells, her cells were genetically unique and stayed alive, and that's the important part. Her cells were used to create cultures um, of these immortal cells that allowed for huge medical advances, including the polio vaccine. Her family had no idea that any of this happened. They didn't know how profitable this bit from their mother was for scientists and manufacturers. She lived in poverty until she died, and then her family lived in poverty often without access to medical care because they're American. This is a white journalist who is humanizing Henrietta Lacks. Um, I did have some discomfort around this. Rebecca Skloot is a white woman who's writing this story and I, I was curious about the profits. Like where do the profits from this book go? Or is it another like white institution, this time publishing, uh, benefiting from Henrietta Lacks. And some of the money from the book goes to the Lacks's scholarship fund. There is some profiting, obviously, because Skloot did the work. Publishing, book selling is, is a capitalist endeavor. Um, but proceeds from the book do go towards a scholarship fund. So that makes me feel a little bit better. I do think learning the history is maybe more important than like the kind of squiggly feeling about profiting off of other people's stories, especially when they've already been used um, and abused by systems. As humans who live now, who benefit from these medical advances as a result of Henrietta Lacks, her cancer cells, I think it's important to know the history. I would highly recommend reading it. Like if you benefit from modern medicine, I think you should read it. Because <laughs> so much of medical discoveries, like the polio vaccine, vaccines in general, like anything that this is being used for, these cells are still being used for. Anything that we benefit from, I think it's important to know that history. Oh, another reread. So, All My Puny Sorrows by Miriam Taves, and I knew I wanted to reread the book before I went and saw the film. So, this is one of my favorite books by Miriam Taves. Miriam Taves is one of my favorite authors. A lot of her works are semi-autobiographical in nature. She is a Mennonite. There is a lot of trauma in the Canadian Mennonite, well, in all the Mennonite communities, but in the Canadian Mennonite community where Taves is from. Within her own life, her father died by suicide and she sort of addressed that and, and wrote through that in another one of my favorite novels, Swing Low a Life. All My Puny Sorrows is a fictionalized dealing with of the suicide of Miriam Taves' sister. So here we have two sisters, Elf and Yoli, who are stand-ins for Miriam and... I'm an asshole, I've forgotten what Miriam Taves' sister's name is. I'll put it on the screen. This book is looking at sisters with diametrically opposing views. Yoli desperately wants Elf to live, and Elf desperately wants to die to the point that she starts to research and ask for medically assisted suicide. I feel like I have to tell you going into this, it is based on Miriam Taves' life. Uh, Miriam Taves' sister did eventually die by suicide. Know that going into this book, after several attempts that we bear witness to as readers, Elf also uh, dies by suicide in this book. That's not really the point. Um, the, it, it's not a surprise twist ending. I haven't spoiled that for you. Uh, I think you need to know that going in. What 
is important about this book is bearing witness to trauma. Like, we're asked to just look at it. There's no good words for this, but we are being asked to bear witness to know that Elf and Miriam's sister lived and that the family still lives and that there's a this relentless um, resilience and dry dark humor that gets them through it and looking at the the sister relationship looking at the mother-daughter relationships in this book I think are really what it's about it's about the family dynamics and the family relationships it is one of my favorite books of all time the adaptation is okay considering how non-linear this book is I had no idea how they were gonna do this in a movie I could see having turned it into like a mini series but I, I think for how challenging this is to adapt uh, they did okay if you're prepared to handle this content Miriam Taves is a stunning writer then I read A Marvelous Light by Freya Marks this is queer fantasy romance question mark. Um, this gives me strong Harry Potter vibes and I am looking for that because JK Rowling has like expressed a terrible opinion. She has been invited in to learn and do better and instead she has doubled down with transphobic rhetoric and as much as those books are a huge part of who I am as a reader, I it's one of the first books, Chamber of Secrets is one of the first books that I remember reading by myself. They were books that like brought us together as a family every summer. We read them together out loud until we were old enough to read them ourselves and then it was like a race of bookmarks through the book. I did part of my master's thesis on Harry Potter. These texts are very much woven into my life and it makes me sad that I can't bring myself, maybe one day I will, but right now I can't bring myself to view them as comforting reads. I am having a really hard time separating that artist from the art uh, and so I'm looking for things that evoke that coziness, that evoke that comfort in the same way that the Harry Potter series did. Um, and this did it for me. It might not do it for you, it depends on what you find comforting about Harry Potter. We have Robin Blythe, who is, for lack of a better term, a muggle. He ends up being sort of mistakenly named this into this civil service role that liaises with the hidden magical world. So all of a sudden it's like, surprise, magic exists and you're our contact with the normal people, the normies. Almost immediately a curse is placed on him. So all of a sudden he's endangered and his magical counterpart is Edwin Corsi, who is cold and prickly. But then they start to work together and then they fall in love and it's beautiful. There's very passionate graphic sex in here. What this series ends up doing, because I've also read the... I read an arc of the second book in this series. I'm not sure when that's out. It could be out already. I'll put it on the screen. I'll let you know if it's out. I'm terrible at keeping up at that now that I'm not physically in a bookstore every day. The sequel's great. It's setting up sort of a find the horcruxes sort of vibe. Uh, there are magical objects that are hidden that the bad guys are looking for and our good guys are also trying to find them to keep the baddies from getting them and doing bad things with them obviously that's very simplistic but if you are interested in that part of Harry Potter if you're interested in the the seventh book the Deathly Hollows, looking for the magical objects there's like this curse this this larger thing happening uh, and our main characters are sort of discovering as they go learning about this magical world and then also queer romance it's perfect. It is so good. I am so excited to see how these books wrap up. So if you feel that void of Harry Potter in your life, if that is no longer a text that you are able to read or support, A Marvelous Light. I would recommend giving it a try. It might not scratch the Harry Potter itch based on what you're looking for. It is obviously not children and it is not in a boarding school 
but there are certain elements of the plot um, that give me that Harry Potter vibe and, and feel cozy in the same way. Then I wanted to talk about Water Shall Refuse Them by Lucy McKnight Hardy. This is deliciously fucked. Holy shit. So I picked this up because it said it had Shirley Jackson vibes. I love Shirley Jackson. I love that sort of quiet domestic horror. The horror isn't like blood and guts, it's domestic. It is humans being fucked up. That is so horrific. I have been disappointed by a lot of things that claim to have Shirley Jackson vibes. This is not one of them. To the point that I am trying to find time to reread it and make a dedicated review, even though dedicated reviews do not perform well on YouTube. Niff's family, a mom, dad, and four-year-old Lori, get away from their lives by going to a cottage in an isolated small town. Niff's mom is in a deep depression. Niff is a 16-year-old outcast. She is unwashed, sort of gone wild, I suppose. And she takes care of Lori, giving him the love and attention that neither parent really seems capable of giving at this point in time. She follows a system of belief that she's invented herself called the Creed. It involves her collecting bird related relics and the creed is about balance and so sometimes she does things that are destructive and painful to put balance back in the world. Add into this that they are in a strange religious community in this small town. It's really a perfect storm. I have thought about this all year, off and on, and I, I finished this on May 1st, so it's haunted me. It has lived rent-free in my brain for a good chunk of this year. So if you are looking for something that evokes that domestic horror of Shirley Jackson, I highly recommend this book. It's so good, it is so good. And I am so excited, because this is, I think, McKnight Hardy's debut novel. I believe she has a collection of short stories out. I am excited to follow her career, because as we know, Shirley Jackson has passed. The works that she has for us to consume are limited. So finding somebody who sort of is interested in exploring similar themes and writing horror in a similar way, I think is a fun discovery for myself. In the wake of the Heartstopper television show, I started consuming all things Heartstopper. So actually I read Heartstopper volumes three and four this year. I'd already read one and two previously, but I want to talk about the whole Heartstopper series. I know this is really hyped and I feel like the problem with hyped things is that we sort of become resistant to them. This is something that I definitely fall into myself. Once it starts getting really hyped, it becomes less appealing. If you have it on your TBR, you already have it on your collection because there's no way that it can live up. And that might be true. I would caution you against unhauling Heartstopper or writing it off forever. It is a really cute, queer love story. The thing that I really like about it is sort of the, the queer fantasy. How many young adult texts can you point to where it's just a, a light, fluffy read where the girl gets the guy. It's just happy and feel good. Whereas it feels like a lot of queer stories to be considered important enough to adapt have to be traumatic. We have to watch horrible things happen to queer young people. I just love that this is queer joy and queer joy in many ways. Like it's not just Nick and Charlie, like Nick exploring his sexuality and, and finding friendship and intimacy with Charlie. There are other queer characters represented in here and we get to see sort of the different ways that people can be queer and exist. I mean, I just talked about horror and domestic horror. So obviously I like terrible things too, but sometimes it's nice to just have a read that feels like a warm hug. It's nice to have something to escape into instead of constantly reading dark, difficult things. And I know that we can't always disengage, but if you do need to, for a little bit, Alice Oseman's works are, they always feel like a warm hug in the end. They're not easy, they're not all fluff, but in the end they always feel hopeful and I appreciate that. Speaking of Shirley Jackson, I reread The Haunting of Hill House. This was on my list of things to reread because it's the book that got me into Shirley Jackson. I have a full video on it. I will link that up above. 
as I reread this, I still love it. I was a little worried that it wouldn't live up to the hype, but I think, again, it's the domestic horror. It's being in this house that is oppressive to be in, like, nothing lines up, nothing makes sense. Like, it centers and sort of traps women in it, and if you think about when Shirley Jackson was writing, the role of women, how gross it would be to be a woman with ambitions getting trapped in the domestic space, um, to have the house around you be like wonky and unwieldy and possessive. If you've watched the television show, the Netflix adaptation, it is very different and I appreciate that. I appreciate that Netflix took the vibes and sort of ran in a different direction because it means that I can still come back to the book and experience this house that lures people in, it it takes them, and the situations in the house make people vulnerable, and how scary that can be. So if you haven't read it, but you like the television show, and you want to experience that in a new way, I would recommend it. I do think it stands up. Another reread, because I was on a, a roll trying to accomplish my goals. I wanted to reread The Smoke It's In Your Eyes by Caitlin Doty. It came along at the perfect time. It got me into thinking about death and my own mortality, end of life plans, being just more comfortable talking to people about death and recognizing that it exists, that it's part of being human, that it can be beautiful if, you know, it's not this scary, chaotic, last-minute thing that you feel like is really out of your control. Seeing her journey into the death industry, into death positivity, I'm glad, I'm glad I read this. I'm glad I reread this. I think Dodie has a really approachable narrative voice. She's very darkly funny. If you've watched her videos here on YouTube, that translates to her writing. And I think it's important for all of us to think about what we want to happen when we die. We have A Prayer for the Crown Shy by Becky Chambers. This is the second in the Monk and Robot series. These are cute little novellas that are very poignant. It's about a future in which tech has become sentient and humanity, instead of dealing with the ethics of sentient tech, set them free into the wild and has gone like low tech, better for the environment, like no plastics, biodegradable, much more sustainable. And it's delightful to see hope. <laughs> Becky Chambers' works are so hopeful and watching our non-binary monk, Dex, um, watching Dex navigate feeling lost, feeling a little bit uncertain with what their calling in life is, and their friendship with a robot. It's cozy. It is very cozy. And I know that Becky Chambers gets, talks to, gets talked about a lot, but I feel like this, the second book here, did not get talked about all that much. Like, I, I, I don't know, maybe I was looking in the wrong places, but I did not see it get as much hype as I expected, so I want to highlight that, hey, it came out. And if you're looking for some hopeful, cozy sci-fi that is very escapist, there's something new for you to read from Becky Chambers that came out this year. Then I want to talk about Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey. This, at the time, I gave, I think, 4.5 stars. And this is another book that just keeps sticking in my brain and I feel like it needs to be on this list because of how it is living in my brain long after I've finished it. This is about twin sisters, one of whom has experienced something that has resulted in her shutting down. The other sister works to repopulate wolves in places where they have been made extinct and it's in an attempt to restore ecological balance, like ugh, the ecosystem is fucked up without a predator in it, so you have an over overabundance of prey that then eat the plants and so then the plants are dying or they don't get big enough, so you have this like huge area that should have the carbon sucking plants on it that it doesn't anymore. And so they are trying to reintroduce wolves to Scotland. There's a murder that takes place and so there's there's drama in this small town around 
these wolves being introduced. I think Lena Norms described this as like 30% environment, 30% sisters, and 30% hot Scott. And I feel like that's pretty accurate. There are a lot of moving pieces here and somehow it works for me. It all comes together and I keep thinking about it. Then we have The Midwich Cuckoos by John Wyndham. This is a book that has sat on my shelf for ages and I didn't touch it because, so I have this thing where I want to read all of John Wyndham's works and so I'm collecting them used in these little penguin editions and despite collecting it I find the cover really off-putting and so I've never picked it up. This is a fantastic read. One day for 24 hours a field sort of comes down over the sleepy town, quiet country town of Midwich. No one can pass in without falling unconscious. Everybody in the town is unconscious for 24 hours. Everybody is like, what the fuck? What are we gonna do here? What is this? Then it passes. It disappears as suddenly as it appears and it sort of dissipates from popular thought because everybody inside Midwich is fine, or so they think. This day out event had really no consequence until a few months later, everybody of childbearing age in Midwich discovers they are pregnant. How did that happen? Um, this is about sexual assault. Um, a mass sexual assault. Uh, it is about men controlling women's bodies. Uh, the narrative is really clever in how it's done. Oh, is it clever? We never hear from the women. So the women are experiencing this really scary thing and there's a committee of men who are trying to shape the narrative and shape the reaction to this. You'll have women who express concerns to their husbands like, holy shit, I didn't consent to this. What am I growing inside me? The men then go back and talk to the committee of men and our narrator, who is a man, is telling us that. So they are times removed always from the women themselves. And that is so cleverly deliberate because this is about silencing pregnant people, controlling pregnant people's bodies. And it's still so relevant. It still feels so relevant in 2022. And I was not expecting that. There are a lot of ethical questions that you can get to by the end. I have a live stream for this as well. I think this is one of the favorite like live stream book club books that I've ever covered. I just enjoyed this so much. I think it's my favorite John Wyndham. If you can handle the subject matter, I would highly recommend this was horrific. Again, speaking more to that domestic horror, um, this is like a quiet, people-y horror. It is about how fucked up we treat each other. The final book I want to talk about is uh, an advanced reader copy. According to Erin Bowe's website, this is coming out on January 31st, 2023. Um, this is an advanced reader copy that I have access to for a contract that I'm working on. I can't reveal more at this time, um, but there will be a lot of children's literature in the December wrap-up. There'll be a lot of children's literature in 2023. Uh, going back to my academic roots, I'm very excited about this contract. Um, and when I can tell you more, I definitely will. For now, just know that you're gonna see a lot of children's lit arcs. That's okay. I'll try and bury them at the end because I know that most people don't care about the children's lit content that I make. Let me tell you what it's called. Oh my goodness. It's called Simon Sort of Says by Aaron Bow. It is middle grade fiction. It is about a boy named Simon who in grade five survived a school shooting. He is the only kid in his year to survive a school shooting. And you need to know that. The text obscures this for quite a while. We just know that Simon is dealing with a lot of anxiety and PTSD. Eventually we do have the details revealed. I feel like it's not a spoiler. This is heavy material. And if you are going to put it in the hands of young people, you as the statistics of my channel show are adults with money and buying power. Kids don't buy things for themselves. So you, as the buyer of the material, need to know that this is about a kid who survived a school shooting. It does not go into graphic detail. It is not bloody and gory, but it is heavy material. I liked this because it is so funny. 
It is so darkly funny. Simon moves to a new town. He needs a fresh start. He doesn't want to be the kid who survived the school shooting anymore. He wants to sort of uh, not be faced with that every day and have a, a fresh start. And so his parents move him to a town that for science reasons doesn't have internet. So this town has a bunch of radio telescopes and those radio telescopes prevent the, the town, anyone in the town, from having access to the internet, having access to phones, having access to television, having access to microwaves, right? Like there's just so many things that this town does not have access to. And this seems like the perfect location for Simon. His mother is a funeral director um, and mortician, I guess, and she buys the local funeral home, the family-run business, and there are a lot of like casual shenanigans around being now like the person who has like one staff member who is shit. Like at one point her staff member loses a body because he forgets to close the door on the hearse um, and they, they lose an elderly man's corpse. It's that sort of shenanigans that we have happening that are just like so dark and funny that you have to laugh. And his father's the local, um, I think they're Catholic. I don't know what priest, deacon, something. His father preaches at the local Catholic church. Um, and at one point there's a family of squirrels that gets into the cupboard where they keep the communion. And the bread has already been blessed and Catholics, I guess, believe that once it is blessed, you have the literal body of Christ and the literal blood of Christ. So when they open up that cupboard and, and discover that a squirrel has eaten the literal body of Christ, they start referring to the squirrel as Jesus squirrel and Jesus squirrel starts causing mayhem in the church. Um, and there are just moments of absolute chaos throughout this book of Simon getting to know some friends in a small town. We have some autistic representation with um, the girl who becomes his friend named Agate. She and Simon become friends and Simon sort of opens up to her. I have a therapist and it just sort of slips out and because Agate has autism and has experienced mental health professionals is like, oh yeah, I've got one of those too. It's cool. It's just that supporting of mental health, a really supportive, healthy friendship. I really, really loved the friendship here. And like, it does deal with some heavy topics, obviously, but the humor, it is so good. It is so, so good. This could be a really good book to talk about with your young person. Um, it is for middle graders. So you're looking at ages nine to 12, roughly. Just because we have this really close, supportive family, it's a really great family dynamic. I love seeing good family dynamics in children's literature. There's great mental health rep. Like, I, I think we need to destigmatize, obviously, seeking help for mental health, uh, normalizing that it's okay to go see a therapist, it's okay to take medication for anxiety, depression, whatever. It's okay to take medication for whatever, um, as long as, you know, prescribed and medically necessary. Um, and so I feel like Simon would be a really relatable character, even though he survives something sort of what feels like as a Canadian larger than life. I don't know if it feels different, if it lands different, if you're an American uh, viewer. There's a cover reveal for it now, which is great because uh, when I first read this, it did not have cover art. Um, and it, it, it looks like this. I'm gonna put it on the screen. It's probably been on the screen the whole time. What am I talking about? That's how I edit these videos. Uh, but appreciate the cover art. I'm just, I'm really excited. This is probably, like, I'm, I'm reading a lot of children's literature right now, and there are things that I read, and I'm like, yeah, I'm glad I read that, but I wouldn't purchase a copy to have in my collection. I feel like this is one that I would love to have in my collection to reference. I have all of my children's lit behind me to reference. If you have young people in your life and you think that they could benefit from seeing some lemonade made from lemons, like it acknowledges that Simon has experienced something horrific and they're not sweeping it under the rug. They are dealing with it as a family. They are laughing about dark things. Once again, that's Simon sort of says by Aaron Bow. 
a last minute addition to this because it's only in like the past week that uh, I think I started on December 19th and it's the 21st now and I think I've read like I want to say like 20 to 40 pieces of children's literature for this contract. At least 20 full things, 40 plus samples definitely. Like where I'm also looking at incomplete advanced reading material for this contract. So uh, I'm not going to be reviewing everything that I've read, but my life right now is children's literature and it's delightful. Those are my favorite books from this year. What was your favorite read from the year? What did you love reading this year that you would love to gift to every single reader? Before we go, we have to thank my patrons who have supported me throughout this year. They make videos like this possible. I am really looking forward to 2023, a new year of new patron perks, sort of revamping the tiers, a new year of book clubs. In January, the patron exclusive book club is starting out reading Fairy Tale by Stephen King. Uh, the Red Rum book club has been reading mostly in chronological order with the occasional deviation here or there just to mix things up. And because we read the Dark Tower series together, Fairy Tale is Stephen King's newest book. Um, I thought it would be fun to uh, look at fairy tale and maybe see how it dialogues with the Dark Tower because uh, it does involve moving into another where and when. So if you are interested in becoming a patron, supporting the channel, having access to the patron exclusive Red Rum Book Club and chatting about fairy tale by Stephen King at the end of January, links to the Patreon page are in the description box down below. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you are doing well, that you are staying safe, that you are having an okay time of year. The holidays can be hard for folks and I will see you soon with another video. Bye!